And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is the author Al Graham from Liverpool, England, who grew up with the Beatles before they became famous, and as fate would have it, became the brother-in-law of the late Jim Morrison. Besides being a living Forrest Gump who has brushed elbows with celebrities for over 50 years, he has had incredible encounters with angels, and he has started the Ministry of Rock in 1987. Alan, thank you so much for being my guest today, and welcome. My honor, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you. Alan, if you don't mind, can we start with your angel encounters, and can you start with your very first one? Well... Ever since I was a child, my mother said, he's different, he's, he's unusual. I've always had weird dreams, wonderful dreams, predicting things that came true within days. My mother would tell me, he's dreamed that, and by God, it came true. And one day, a lady was walking by the house, and, I, and my mother called her over and said, please come here. My son had a dream about you, and she, she, he dreamed that you won the pools or the lottery, and they laughed and went on. Two days later, that lady came knocking at the door and said, I won the pools! So from then on, I knew as a young man that I was different, and I was an altar boy when I was a young man, and I learned the Latin Mass, and I, I'm still a practicing Catholic. I go to church in my local church here, but I started my own ministry, and it's not a Catholic ministry. It's an all-inclusive, even Muslims I counsel, so, and everyone else. I don't care what religion or faith you are, I'm there to pray. And I wonder if you'd be so kind as to let me open the show with a prayer that I do every day simple prayer called the credo in the catholic church it means i believe sure okay in nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti amen credo in unum deum patrum omnipotentum factorum celia terra visibilium omnum et invisibilium et unum sectum catholicum et apostolicum ecclesiam et una baptisma in remissionem peccatorum et expecto resurrectionum mortuor vito venturi sequeli. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So I pray with everybody I meet, because this, this prayer puts me in a state of grace immediately. And uh, I'll just tell you one quick story about a state of grace. I first married De Morrison's sister. We had a Young baby coming, going to be a week. I'm at working at this night job, two jobs, night job. My, this new baby's coming. I've got this whole new responsibility. Before that, I was a feather in the wind and go wherever I want, did whatever I want. She came along. We got married. We had a child. And I suddenly dawned on me, oh, my God, all this, all this responsibility. And I panicked. I would have panic attacks, and I remembered my Catholic prayers, and I said, Great on unum dem, and I prayed and prayed and prayed. Within seconds, I was surrounded by the warmth of heaven and the presence of angels, and I drifted off into a most magnificent sleep. Every single time since, I, <clears throat> under any stress, I go there and I get instant relief and I urge anyone, whatever it is you have, no matter what happens, try to go to that place. Say your little prayer, whatever it is, you will get an answer right away. In my, in my belief, my deep belief, that's what happens. If you don't believe, <laughs> you get coconuts. In doing my research of you, I read about you had an angel encounter and they encountered you on the street and told you to go back to a bar and help somebody out or something. This recently scared me to death. 
frightened me, shook me up. I was having my afternoon ritual, a Sunday afternoon, lovely cold beer, a rock and roll band on a patio, and some chicken wings. Finished them up, I said to myself, self, let's go looking for some more fun across the street in another place where sometimes they allow me to karaoke and they don't throw me out. So I'm, I stepped out of the door and there were two odd looking men. One had silver hair, gray silver. The other one had blonde, right, like a, the gods. And they both had eyes. How can I say it? They were glistening and it was almost like electrical. It was almost like a Morse code. And I was looking at them and then I was terrified. I don't know why, but it was almost like, wow, what is this? And they came up to me, said, where are you going? I said, I'm going over there to that karaoke place or whatever, the other place I was going to, another restaurant. They said, no, 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 you, you're going that way. And I went, you're going that way. And I said, no, I'm going that way because I am a free man. I am not a number. I do not take orders. And they went, they, I, one put his finger up like that. And I, their hands looked like they'd been in a furnace, thick, tough. They looked like gangster angels, if anything. That's what I thought right away, gangster angels. So I think they've been pushing back evil or whatever it was they've been putting that they had such a serious look on their face that I said, well, I think I'd better comply. So I said, all right, I'll do that. Cajoling him a little bit. And I went that way and I was going to duck down the alleyway and pretend that I was going to go, but not go. I got, I got around the corner. And one of them was waiting for me. And I went, no, he must have flown. He couldn't have got there that quick because I'd gone that way. He'd gone this way, but that was a longer way. I was taking a shortcut. So he stood there looking at me like this. So I, I, I think I went back. I forgot something to tell you. He said, they, they both said to me, you have an assignation. You have someone you're going to meet over there, right there, right now. And you better hurry up. So finally I said, I better listen. I went back there. I didn't see a single thing. So I said, I'm going to my bar and I'm going to walk right past them. I'm going to get tough. All of a sudden, a little fellow come running out of the restaurant. He said, I found you. I found you. And I said, I wasn't lost. And he said, no, no, no. I met two guys and they told me someone who looked like he was going to be right here, right at this time. I didn't believe them. I said, did they tell me what they looked like? They described them to a T, even their hands. And uh, I went, once again, the terror, but it was also joy. Can you imagine that? Both emotions mixed. So he said to me, can I buy you a single malt? <laughs> and I said, well, loves me a single malt. Yes, you can buy me a single malt. He said, anyway, these two angels, we got the single malt and we're sitting there talking. He said, these two, he didn't say angels, he said, these two guys told me that you would be able to help me pray. And I said, don't you know how to pray? He said, yeah, but I forgot. So I pulled out my card and I said, you know, I'm Reverend Graham. He said, oh, I didn't know that, but okay, teach me. He said his mother was very ill and dying of cancer and he was too, he didn't know what to do. And he said, So we prayed. We prayed the De Profundus. The Catholic prayer, I'll give you a couple of lines of it. Out of the depths I have cried to thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my prayer. And it was about what we call a prayer of intercession, which means we ask God to intercede with whatever the ailment or the disease is and perhaps save a life. And he prayed with me. We cried together. We had another single malt he was buying. And he left. And I, so I said that wonderful experience. I put it all down to, you know, God sent those gangster angels to let me know that sometimes, no, every time when you get a call from the throne, you go now. 
you do not do what you want to do. And that was a lesson for me. So I go back to find these two gangsters and they were still there, standing in the doorway. And I, I was going to go up and go, well, I did, did what you told me. They ignored me, acted like I didn't even exist. And I thought to myself, when, as I walked past them to my karaoke bar, they looked like they're waiting for somebody else. And by God, they were waiting like that. And I thought, whoa, they're all around us everywhere. Maybe you don't see it. The world doesn't see it, but I do. First thing people, uh, logical people will say, oh, look, you need to go see a shrink because you hallucinated. Somebody dropped acid in your beer at the bar. You know what I mean? All these things come to. In my world, I mock them for trying to mock me because my feelings, I know, are much better than the miserable feelings that they have with doubt and with suspicion or, you know, looking down on someone for talking about angels. But they're as real as you and I are talking to me and they surround me every day. And as a consequence, I call on my Father in heaven and the heavenly throne to send a legion of ghostly angels to anyone, anywhere, anytime. As a matter of fact, I did it this morning because I have a ministry in Pakistan called Fountain Ministry and an orphanage that I sponsor, Bagel College and uh, a church. And I, uh, hold on a minute. Can, um, sorry. So I send, I ask for 10,000 angels to surround the people who work there and the people who, and the children and everyone else. And as I'm doing it, I'm feeling the power coming out of me and into me and through to them. And they're all thanking me. And in this, we're all in the same state of mind and it's a wonderful place and i'll take that above anything and i defy anyone to tell me i'm hallucinating or i'm out of my mind go ahead bounces off me al i'd like to talk to you a little bit about jim morrison since you were his brother-in-law was jim a spiritual guy in the largest sense yes because his whole effort was about being a shaman or a shaman, mm. a leader, a spiritual leader. In fact, that's what he called himself. And he behaved like a shaman. In his act on stage, he would do what we call a purification dance, a ritual. If you ever watch him, he was always in the, in the Afri um, Indian, American Indian culture, they have a purification dance. Peruvians have one, Incas, all of us. Catholic Church doesn't have a dance, but they have a purification ceremony. So Jim Morrison was, as he was singing and dancing, he was pointing at the floor, and he was pointing to the sky, and he was pointing over here. What he was doing was, the shaman would be shaking a rattle, and he'd have a feather, and he'd point to the snake, and he'd point to the bird in the tree, and he'd point to the sky. He would celebrate the entire cosmos through this purification dance. So Jim Morrison did that. Most people had no idea what he was doing, but he was. In his writings, he was deeply, deeply spiritual. At the same time, he was deeply, deeply troubled and conflicted. And actually, alcohol was the main problem but throughout those five years that he was a lot that he was famous he produced timeless music beautiful poetry and to this day it is as relevant as anything else most rock stars they die at 50 fat and horrible and they, that's where you remember them Jim Morrison died as a very young man, 27 years old, and he is remembered. And as a consequence, most young men who come through life to this place that we call rites of passage, 
they have a conflict with their parents. I'm going to be this. No, you're not going to. There's always that, especially between sons and fathers, which was the whole, the essence of Jim Morrison and his father, conflict. And so they find this music. I don't know how, but they do. And this is the 60th year, and I can talk to any teenager and say, do you know the doors? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't say, do you know Elvis? Uh, no. Jim Morrison he is eternal. He is perpetual. And that's why I think that's the aspect of him that I saw as completely, deeply, utterly, not religious, spiritual. In fact, one morning, I'm going to tell you this funny story, not funny to religious people, but he and his brother, Andy, were driving. They borrowed dad's car and they were driving around on Sunday morning, cruising playing the music, cruising. But a bunch of people in front of this church, all dressed up in the Sunday best. And Morrison was resentful, not resentful, but he didn't want to be part of a church or any of that. And so he yelled out the window, God is dead. And so all those people, pranking people. That's the essence of the young Jim Morrison. What was your relationship with him like? Well, I was the guy who knocked him out. But I'm the only guy to ever knock him out. He was a drunk beyond compare. But when he wasn't drinking, he was a beautiful, smart, happy, witty, well-read, highly intelligent. In fact, his professor at UCLA, Brokaw, at the UCLA Film School told me in an interview, he was the brightest that ever came through here. But, and he gave me a little instance. He said, we'd all be talking in a group about film, noir. And uh, somebody would ask a question and Jim was right in the middle of a conversation with the professor. And, and he said, yeah. And then somebody asked a question and he said, well, and when he turned around, Jim was gone. So that's how singular he was. He was never part of a group, he was always he called himself the Lizard King for this reason. The lizard is an arbitrary species, which means it exists outside of the food chain. So everything else on Earth died, the lizard would survive. And he believed that he was of that nature. And, he, and, he, and it came to fruition because 60 years later, he's still alive, as far as I'm concerned. He called himself the Lizard King. I am the Lizard King. I can do anything. So along with that mantle, and he could in his, when he was in, in his, at his zenith, his, his celestial star was at noon. There was none more brilliant than young Jim Morrison. He read everything. Just like his sister Anne, she read everything. When I first met her, she was a walking encyclopedia thesaurus. She could say, tell me what a word was derivation, origin, everything, without looking at the dictionary. That's how brilliant she was. The father, the admiral, was a nuclear admiral. He was genius level. Jim, Andy Morrison, his younger brother, another well-read guy. All the Morrisons were book readers except the mother. She read spy novels. Mm. So she was not intellectual, but the rest of them were. And I uh, swear to God, such an assemblage of brilliance in one household. Jim would come home from college and he'd sit down and he's, he would demand that everyone at the table speak only in rhyming couplets. Wonderful exercise for your mind and for your, and it's so he, he, was, he was a wonderful man. I loved him dearly, but I had to knock him out one night because I took him, I came to Los Angeles with Anna and my young son, Dylan. He was nine months old. And we, we went to his girlfriend's house and she was going, hey, he's gone again. He ran off with a bunch of pirates and they're all down here. And she gave me several addresses where he might be. I went and found him. I dragged him out. And actually, I... That was another time. I found him 
at Electra Studios where he was recording with Robbie Krieger and the Doors. I walked in where he was sitting down with Robbie Krieger plunking. I tussled his hair and he went, <laughs> I'm, I'm working right now, but go sit in the booth. I sat in the booth for about half an hour. And then he took a break and we went next door and we celebrated that fellow. His name was Jack Daniels. Hmm. We had a couple of shots and then we had two more. And then suddenly he said, whoa, I got to get back in there. Well, when we came outside, it was nighttime and the door to the studio had been locked. He couldn't get in. He went, ah. he picked up a potted plant and he hurled it through the plate glass window of Electra Studios. And out of the parking lot came the recording manager. His name was Paul Rothschild, produced all the records. He was been sitting in his car, smoking something, and very upset that Jim did not come back, and me too. And so he got out of his car, a little tiny fellow, pedantic, I call him the Silenus, because he looked like a Silenus, which is a Greek god, one of them, a lesser god, with a ball head. And Rothschild had a ball head. And he was pedantic and angry. He said, I got it. I don't like to be. I spent some time in prison, and every minute of my life is precious. And so Jim said, yeah, but I can't do what you were doing. You had a, you had a dressing screen around me, and it was, it was worthless. He said, I'm trying to get an echo, Jim. And he said, it was ridiculous. So he said, well, look, I can't work that way. And, uh, tomorrow we'll try it again. And he said, yeah, okay. But that, <laughs> that was my experience. <laughs> so I get him home to visit with my wife and his son and Pamela. And when he walked in, I could see a seething anger from an earlier fight. I looked on the floor. There was a gold record. The Doors' first gold record, and he booted it across the floor. And a, a black mark from his shoe, his boot, was left in it. And I looked around and went, "Oh my God! There's been a fist fight here." Well, she'd broken a bunch of stuff in anger, and uh, so I brought him back to that. Unknowingly, I brought him back to that same fight. So I sat on the couch, and his sister was standing by the wall with the baby, talking to Pamela. And she put on a record called, Oh, Happy Days, When Jesus Walked. <laughs> it was a guy called Chambers, a wonderful song. So this record was playing. Morrison disappeared. So I sat down on this long suede couch. And next thing I know is he comes behind me and bashes me on the top of the head with a stuffed llama. Five foot high llama. Very chic back then, big stuffed animals. But it was full of heavy flock. Almost drove me through the couch, and I got I got so angry, I jumped up and I started chasing him around the room. And the rooms are all connected, if you know that kind of a layout in California. Every room is connected, you walk through that room. So we started going around and around like two cartoon characters. And at some point, I got tired, and I stopped, and I put my hand on the baby grand, and I watched him go through three more times looking for me. Then, I, then he came and saw me. And so I started going that way and he hit me in the back of the head with a Bible, right in the back of the head. Then the fight was on. I chased him, I went around like a fast cartoon, a Popeye cartoon. So once again, I stopped for a rest and he turned on me and his eyes, I swear to God, like two skulls, red, so drunk. He took a dive at me, and I saw him coming, of course. I, I'm a kid from Liverpool, and I'm a street fighter. He is not. He had long hair, big cowboy boots on, big pea coat, smelling of alcohol, come raging at me in anger because I brought him home and to this fight that they were having, grabbed him by the curly locks, and twisted him, pulled him this way. His boot went through a plate glass window, shattered it, not plate glass, a big window. He went out the window. I went out after him, holding his hair. And we landed on a baby buggy, which was an antique 
baby buggy that Pamela had bought in Italy and she brought it back and she was gonna open this chic boutique called Nemus, which eventually opened. We crushed the baby buggy flat as a pancake. Five grand up in the air. That was 50 grand back then. Yeah. I, we, I got him back and pulled him back inside the window and I tried to calm him down. I got him on the couch and I said, stop it, man. Oh, I, I came up here to see you and you're going crazy on me. And he booted me in the face with those cowboy boots right here. So I snapped. And in Liverpool, we have a tactic called the Liverpool kiss. You can watch any good soccer player doing it. He goes up for the ball and he snaps it like that. He puts it in the net. Well, that's the way people where I come from fight. They don't use their hands. They don't use their feet. They don't use a knife. They didn't. It's all changed now. They use this. And it's lightning speed, and I hit him once, twice, right here. His eyes begun to swell up immediately, and tears just gushed out his eyes like that. And then he passed out. The whole time, oh, happy day, was playing in the back. Pamela was urging, hit him, hit him. All of his friends just hold him down. He's a celebrity. They hold him down until he calms down, but he's always causing fights in bars and yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I looked up at her and I was about to say, what the? He woke up and he looked at me like, why'd you do that to me? I, and tears were coming out of his eyes and passed out again. We put him in bed, and I, I told Anna, and by the way, Anna and my baby were plastered up against the wall, like scared to death watching this whole thing. Anna was n as nonviolent, was never violent. So we put him to bed, and I said, okay, we're going to leave. There's nothing here. He's going to sleep it off. As we were leaving, I heard her gleefully on the phone telling somebody, oh, Alan just knocked his ass out, and then he's the first one to, oh, she was in glee. And I loathed her, loathed her from that moment on to this day in her grave. I cannot, and I must, I know, get over what she was and what she did to that man, because it was he who suffered more than her for her heroin addiction. He was broken down. He went to Paris partly because he was burned out with the ban with alcohol, but mostly because of his disappointment. She had great potential once, and she was nothing but a heroin addict, and downers and every other. The juxtaposition was hilarious because she was also a health food freak. Brown rice and orange juice diets and stuff like this is a total dichotomy contradiction, whatever you want to say. So I hold no, I don't think I'll ever get over it, but I try every day to, to put, put this past me because that man left this earth under mysterious circumstances and that's putting it lightly. Now, since he's left, he's been haunting you. Can you tell us about that? He's been terrorizing me since the day I was producing a rock opera in Hollywood called Morrison the Rock Opera with seven Jim Morrison lookalikes and a cast of thousands, I used to brag. You know, we had the blues singers, we even had a Marilyn Monroe who came in and did a scene. And we had Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix. We had our own cast. And it was a wonderful, clunky musical because I was new at the business. I didn't know anything about it, but a year later, the, the whole story about that rock opera led into my father-in-law, Jim's father, telling me, you, no, -uh. no, we're not doing it. In the beginning, he gave me his blessing, but then as things got on and he realized it was going to be something, and I'd gotten big financing from Sylvester Stallone, among others. When he saw it was coming to reality, he didn't tell me that he pulled his backing out, but he let my wife, Anna, and me go on, get the script ready, get the actors ready, 
And then one day we heard through back channels that he was not supportive and therefore we couldn't go ahead. And so Anna called him and said, Dad, what are you doing? And he said, what? What are you talking about, honey? He said, we just read or we heard from a lawyer that you were not, you were against the project and that if Alan went forward, you would sue us. And he said, that's not true, honey. That's absolutely not true. So we continued on. And by God, another week later, I got a call saying, I'm warning you, there's a lawsuit pending on you if you go forward. She called him back. Dad, please tell me if this is true. And he said, well, honey, it is true. I had to tell you, but I was just trying to save Alan and you from embarrassment. Uh, when those Hollywood people get a hold of the project, they're going to make it awful. And my son's going to look awful and you're going to look, and I'm going to look awful. And I don't want anything to do with it. And he said, and the other thing is, Alan mentioned my name in an interview with Showtime Television that I never mentioned his name, but it did say, there's a movie now being made with uh, Jim Morrison, Sylvester Stallone wanted to play him, John Travolta, uh, Alan Graham and his wife, Anne, are now doing their own production. He got calls from across the globe saying, Admiral, I hear you're doing a movie. I hear you're going to be in it with your uniform and all that, right? He snapped. He realized that this film, this truth, was coming to the fore. So he, I talked to him. He said to me, well, you know what? I don't see what the story is here. Now, the cash registers are ringing all over the world with the name of Jim Morrison, and you don't see the story? And he said, well, can you tell me what it is? I said, it's the truth about what happened. And then I dawned on me. He didn't want the truth. He didn't want it to know anyone. Anyone to know what Jim had kept up, and we all had kept up. Nobody knew a thing about the inside of the family. He did not want a tabloid on it. Instead of telling me that, he cajoled me and kidded me. So said, sure, you have my blessing, son. As if to say, you'll never get the money. We got it. We're all ready to go. Put the kibosh. We exposed it. We exposed him. And that was the beginning of the end for me because I doubled down. And I said, I'm going to go independent. I'm going to get financing one way or the other from someone who isn't worried about a lawsuit, who will love the controversy. And I found one. The most unlikely person on earth actually called me and said, my wife is very interested in your project. And I've got all the money in the world, and I don't care about a lawsuit, come on in and meet me at my mansion, and we'll talk about it. I won't tell you who the name is yet in a later broadcast. We went, we met, we signed a contract. That, I can't tell you who it is, but he fell in love with Jim's sister and us and everything, and he was fully on board until the federal marshals came and arrested him for a very large incident that occurred in Los Angeles. And as a magazine owner, he had put his nose into the investigation and they told him, stop, stop, stop. And like me, he said, and the horse you rode in on. So they came and arrested him. And that's when things went completely haywire because by that time, from the time I met him, it was like seven weeks, I had become his most trusted confidant. I had become more important than any of the group inside of his empire. Bodyguards, wife, brother, and a cadre of financial investors in his company. He put me in charge. He gave me the power of attorney. And that's when it all exploded. I went to a place called Springfield, Missouri, and I took a team of operatives, all the most bizarre people, to picket the prison where this fellow was incarcerated. And my life went haywire. I announced to the media that I was divorcing my wife, Jim's sister, 
and I was fully taking on the mantle of security, bodyguard, protector of the man who was in jail, and I was going to go on a campaign to get him out. We did. Three months later, we got him out. In the aftermath, I got a letter one morning from Admiral Morrison said that we are filing divorce papers again. We? Not my wife? You? Yeah. They convinced my wife that I was out of my mind, which I was, to divorce me. They sent me the papers, I signed them, and the Admiral got them back and he went, wow, that is a very noble act of your ex-husband. I asked for nothing, not a rusty nail. I was broke, I was done, couldn't get arrested myself. Lost all the financing, lost the momentum of what I had, which was I was a, a name producer in Hollywood. And I was ready to launch one of the biggest, most beautiful projects ever. So I vowed vengeance. And in the form of, I will never, ever, ever again acquiesce or give up my quest, the one I believe in. And that is to make a movie write a book, tell a story about Jim Morrison and be damned anyone. However, I waited until they were senile and dead, one of them, till I really fully came out and spoke like this, like I'm speaking to you. And they will never hear it, except if they're in heaven, then they'll hear the honest story of what the Clara, his mother was not like his father. She was secretly would engage with me and I would go on in little investigations if, it, if there was a child of Jim Morrison somewhere or an obscure tape that I would go and find it for her and bring it and she kept all of it. He had nothing to do with it. She had to hide it from him. So here's where I am saying that to this very day, I will and am until the day I die pursue the truth which is the real reason for me beginning a podcast in a few days, because I'm going to talk about the very last days of Jim Morrison in Paris and what exactly happened. So how did he start haunting you? Well, when I went, when I went to Sylvester Stallone's house one morning, he was waiting for me and he had red silk boxer shorts totally suntan, totally buffed, but from steroids, not from workouts. And cowboy boots on. It was a hot summer day, June day, and he said to me, this, this is how he talked. Yeah, yeah, we got told you about the script. We got told you about the script. I want to talk to you about the script I've been working on for the movie we're working on. I get, I get upstairs and he said, hey, we done. I'm going to be right back. I'm going to show, show you something. Walked down the hallway, click, click, click with these cowboy boots on. I heard the music go on. I started to read. I, he, he portrayed himself as Jim Morrison. I heard a voice sound like Quasimoto. He's playing a song and singing along with it. He comes walking down the hallway, up to the desk, and ends with, I froze. And he said, what do you think about that? And honestly, I said to him, I've never heard anything like that in my life. And he went, oh, you think it was that good? And he walked away and I went, I heard a voice. His voice, Morrison, that said, what are you doing in that tone? I said, making a movie. And he said, with him? That loud, really echoing. I said, He's got the money. And he said, there's something really bad going to happen with this, Alan. Something really, really bad. You mark my words. And then I think he jumped into some kind of underground tunnel because I heard him laughing. <laughs> if you know his laugh, it was the most mocking, hilarious, guffawing. Ah. And I said to myself, self, get your dear stalker hat. Get your Sherlock Holmes pipe and cape and even get a bloodhound and go after that son of a gun. And I did that, 
and I've been pursuing them ever since. However, everything, every time I've done something wrong, he's been there with me to pinch me or laugh at me or mock me. But just in the last few years, I would say, but mostly in the last year, I feel like he's got his hand on my shoulder. Right now, even. And I might be completely have had a mental breakdown and don't know it, or I'm in the best state of bliss I've ever been because everything I touch now turns to gold. Every little project, and I have many projects, by the way, uh, many businesses that I engage in, mostly the production of my book, which is published in French also. And I, at the end of the show, I would hope you would let me give a shout out to some of the people who have helped me in this enterprise and who I rely on most implicitly. Hmm. That's my ghost story. But I want to tell you this about ghosts. Jim is an unsettled spirit. He, he was, I want to say, murder most foul behind what I'm trying to say. But in the very least, the, the person who was with him and gave him the substance he died from was none other than Pamela Curzon, his girlfriend. And a bunch of junkies in Paris who she attached herself to, one of them was Marianne Faithful, the 60s rock singer from England. As tears go by, Rolling Stones did a cover of it. Or she did a cover of that. I don't know which one. Her and another guy called the Count, who was a notorious dealer. He dealt in Marseille heroin, which is 89% pure junk. The best on earth. And that's what Pamela gave him. He collapsed in a club called Les Cirques on the Champs-Élysées in Paris, a famous rock and roll nightclub. And I believe he died right there. They picked him up, all of these friends. Agnes Varda, another great film, French film director, was in on it too. They all got him back to the apartment. They put him in a bathtub, which is what you do with someone who's overdosed on heroin to revive them in a warm bath. She claimed to the police later that they came home from that club. They went to bed. He didn't feel very well. And he said it to her, I'm going to take a warm bath, you know, I'll feel better. So she said, okay. She went there, saw him climb into the bathtub. He was relaxed. He said, are you okay? She said, yeah, I'm fine. She went back to bed, but she slept for five hours. That's what she told the police. That was what's in the police report. I woke up. I went in the bathroom. I said, Jim didn't come back to bed. And I went back in and he was frozen and he was bloated. Whatever she said, his face was, and he was dead. Well, she didn't bother to call the police for two hours, 7 a.m., the police report tells us, which meant that she had all of her cabal, all those friends, come up with that story of how he died. However, it all was unraveled when I did an investigation myself and I acquired the photographs of the death scene. And it was a picture of Jim Morrison dead, in the bathtub, five hours. You can imagine what five hours in the water looked like. The only one problem with the picture was this. I never heard anyone else say this or question this. Because it was too late. He's dead. He's in the grave. She's dead. Who are you going to investigate? Nobody. I found this. His head was resting against the giant faucets. Have you ever taken a bath with your head against the faucets? So he was placed in there. He did not get in there. His story does not hold up. She was lying through her teeth. Guess what her next move was? She got on the phone with her father and her mother in Los Angeles, and they put in place the lawyers to get Jim Morrison's estate into her name by claiming that she had lived with him for seven years and thus... Gaining 
We lost connection. Yeah, it happens sometimes. All right, you were saying that uh, you you started on where she had called her family and was transferring his estate into her. Trying by false pretenses to claim she lived with him for seven years. And what she did in that effort was to gain, gather all of these affidavits from friends who said, oh yes, I remember when Jim and Pam lived over there. They lived there for about two years, and on and on and on. And the last part of it, because she really only knew him six, to be quite honest. She claimed that they went to Colorado and live there, which is the place where you would get a judge to grant it. I'm very lenient in Colorado. So they stayed there a couple of nights at a bed and breakfast. She claimed they lived there for the, re the rest of the balance of the time, which would have made it seven years. The judge said to her, well, look, the Morrisons are not coming forward. His lawyers are not coming forward. The doors are not coming forward. I guess you're a common law wife. And she got all of it. She got every bit of the estate, cutting out the doors, cutting out the Morrisons, cutting out everything. She had it all, lock, stock, and barrel. Then next morning, nope, sorry, the same evening, she was celebrating with some of her famous potion. And she went a little bit too far. And they found her the next morning with her legs up in the kitchen like a dead cockroach. And she was Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, and Pamela Curzon because she was 27 too. Bada bing. Hmm. Now you knew the Beatles before they were famous. Yeah. Were any of those guys spiritual from what you knew John, of them? Well, of course, John Lennon was to me. But George Harrison got very much into Maharishi, and so did all the Beatles for a while. But John Lennon was pure spiritualism, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. One day, as a young man, I'm standing in front of the cabin. I worked across the street. I, was, I worked at a tailor shop, and I was impeccably dressed in tailor suits because I was advertising my product. And I walked around, lived, breathed, impeccable tailoring. And so on my lunch hour, I was waiting for the matinee to start, which was the Beatles matinee. They played for an hour and a half every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then they did a night show. A little cabin was down the stairs. Well, you know the cabin. You've heard of the cabin? Right. It was actually an old cellar where they stored fruit. And, and the buildings around still stored fruit. That was the only one that didn't. You could smell the fruit. Rotten, too, sometimes. Anyway, it was a big area for trucks and all these trucks are coming down. John Lennon comes out of the cabin after, before his show. He's dressed in cool black leather. He's got a bit of a pump. But then long hair was like combed down here. Nobody had real long hair. They had a, you know, quiff, uh, like the 50s rock and roll guys. But that's what he looked like. He had jeans on and black boots. Black suede boots. And he looked cool. When I went in to watch him play, he was cool. They played all Little Richard and all the blues songs and all the rock and roll of the day. And he looked at me as if to say, well, look at that smart young man. He looked me up and down for the longest time. And I looked in his eyes and I saw rebel, genius, wisdom, old soul because he'd lost his mama when he was little and he was put in an orphanage by his father called Strawberry Fields. You ever hear that song? Yeah. That's what he was singing about. Put in there and his father went off to sea and left him. Nobody, no one but him. So I think the angels descended upon him as a young man to look after him because actually he was supposed to grow up and do this phenomenal thing and he and one other man, Paul McCartney, put together the greatest writing team since Rodgers and Hammerstein. And not only in their royalties, but in their content. Paul McCartney wrote beautiful spiritual songs. He was a Catholic like me. John was agnostic, but they used to go to a church on a Sunday afternoon and sit in the graveyard next door and they call it the Bone Orchard. 
and they would write songs in there. And one day, they were looking around, and John said, look at that gravestone. And he said, Helena Rigby, 1868-1877. A young maid had died, and Helena Rigby sits in the church. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful song. And that's, what, that's how they got their stuff from real life. So I figured he was blessed by the angels for a reason, to protect him when he had no protectors. He was in an orphanage. He was all alone. And I think he gained that wonderful spirituality because that's what came out to me when I first saw him. And when he, killed, when he got killed, can't tell you what grief I was in for a long, long time. But I also call on him. Well, as sure as I call on heaven, I call on him. Are you there, Big John? And it, it's like, yeah. He doesn't talk to me like the other bastard, Morrison, doesn't torture me like him. But now he doesn't even torture me. He's given me his blessing, and I'm sailing a ship called the Crystal Ship. In French, it is the Navi de Cristal, the Crystal Ship. That's the name of my podcast. That's the name of my new enterprise. And it's about... All the things I'm doing in one podcast, in commerce, I'm selling books, literature. In fact, if you go to my silo, you'll see all the products I'm doing. So that's my new venture, Le Cristal Navigar, or Le Navigar Cristal. Now, you've brushed elbows with celebrities for over 50 years. Have any of these celebrities told you any of their own personal supernatural or paranormal stories? Yes. However, the greatest one I ever heard was a fellow I told you I went to protect him. So I'm not going to mention his name, but I'll tell you the story. Everyone said he's gone out of his mind. He's talking to angels. Jimmy Carter's sister, Ruth Carter Stapleton, came to visit one day and told him, I believe that you have been visited by angels. And, and he said, well, of course, like, you know, I know, no one else does. And she said, I'll tell you what to do. All the bad you're doing now, just stop it and come on this side with me and we'll launch a campaign for angels. And he said, great. He went, he went back to his business partners he went back to his wife and his brother and all the people who had interest in his business, which was a naughty business. And he said to them, I want to take all of the naughty out of my business. I want to go straight. And they went, what? No, who will sponsor us? He said, I don't care. I want to do the work of God, what God told me to do. Right after that, he was shot in the stomach with a high-powered hunting rifle, shot his spleen out, missed his colon, and that's what saved his life. When he fell down and was hospitalized, <coughs> the predators, his family and his friends and his business associates, came back and put the naughty back in the business and it started flourishing. It was dying when he put in, excuse me, it was dying because he'd added the angels. Hmm. And so the story goes like this. He told me and Ruth Carter Stapleton, one day I was flying at 30,000 feet and through the wall of the plane, an old man with gray hair and white clothes and beautiful, beautiful eyes, glittering eyes, he sat next to him. And he looked at me and said, as surely as you and I are talking, he said there. And I said, what did he say? And he said, do good. And so I believe him, of course, because ever since then, I believe it too. I still believe that he saw that. He died recently, but he went his whole life in a better place than he'd ever been before through all his years of turmoil because of that visitation. 
Now, a lot of other people, like Sylvester Stallone's mother, Jackie Stallone, got on the spiritual kick and they got websites and said, I'm talking, I'm a talking psychic and all that bullshit made millions, all of them. Dia said, $9.99, call up, it costs you nine. By the time you talk, you spend $400. You know what I'm talking about. That whole thing died out because of some serious lawsuits, and I was instrumental in bringing them because it was no different than Houdini. He was a pure man, too. He, he vowed to knock all of those fake spiritualists off the air, out, out of the business back then. And we did it. They're gone. You'll never see them again. Too, too much legalese around it for any station, even Google wouldn't carry it. No one will ever touch that. Although they do have little psychic shows here, but it will never go high tech, big business, big money ever again because it was a fleecing of the spiritual people of this country. That's what I saw mostly in Hollywood was that kind of bullshit. Sylvester Stallone's mother would call him up when she was on like uh, Rosie O'Donnell. She would go in there to promote a psychic business. She'd call her son up and say, Hi, son. And he said, man, look, Ma, you don't call me. Like you don't, you don't call me. Don't do the show. She said, well, at least just tell him that I'm psychic. Right? He went, yeah, Ma, you're psychic. He hung up. He didn't even want to touch it. Hmm. So that's what I met mostly in Hollywood. And it's still there, except it's, you know, smaller groups, little cliques, and a lot of wacko people who believe it and believe every little seance. It's bullshit. Excuse my French, but the true reality of spirituality is as, as real as rain to me, and I believe to you too. Now, you've also been instrumental in shutting down puppy mills. Can you tell yeah. us about that? A couple of years ago, my team and me, we call ourselves the Angel Enforcers, and we'd go search them out. Went to a little mall. This is how it occurred for me. I was oblivious to it. I went to, my wife had breast cancer. And the little dog that she had, it was Frankie, Frankie, the healing dog, we call him. Because when my children got this little puppy, he's that big, it's called a dorky, a dachshund and a Yorkshire terrier mix. He never got more than that. And we laid her on a chest when she was asleep and she woke up and just smiled at him and grabbed him. In one year, she came back clean. The next year, clean. And we haven't had a whisper since. And that was 15 years ago. So, the dog got killed in the alley, ran out and got hit by a car. So, I went to a mall and there were all these beautiful puppies and I bought one, it was a beautiful little thing. I brought it home. She couldn't accept it because she missed her Frankie so much. It broke our hearts. Eventually, she accepted it and she became Lily, our golden retriever, and we loved her. Three days after I got her, somebody went to somebody's house and they said, there's something wrong with that dog. So we took it back to the, to the vet, and they said, oh, man, this dog's got all kinds of wrong with him. So, Where'd you get this dog? And I said, from this shop. And they said, do you know about puppy mills? I said, no. Ta started educating me, my vet. So I went back to that store with badges, me and four enforcers. And we said to the guy, come here. Give me my money back, and you're going to shut this puppy mill down. It's not a puppy mill. Yes, it is. We proved it. Two weeks later, it was shut down. And ever since then, I see one hint of it, or even a puppy breeder, which I see at the park with a truckload of puppies trying to sell them. I commandeer them, and I command them to get out of town or else. I have simply without portfolio. I have no right to do it. I have no authority or jurisdiction but I do have determination and I bring heavy people with me and it works. All right, Al, you've written three books. One of them's called I Remember Jim Morrison 2. 
Another one's called Before the Beatles Were Famous. And another one is called Poet Rain. Do we get those on... Do we get those on Amazon or do we get them on your website? You can go directly to my website on that link and I have PayPal page, Venmo, everything. You can buy it there or you can go to um, Amazon. It's on there. In fact, you can go to any bookshop in the world and ask for my book and they'll get it for you. Even if if it's not in the store, it's online and they can order it for you. So it's accessible in every country. And I must say, since just a few weeks ago, I got the French translation. My wonderful publisher in Paris, his name is Eric Eric Lamiroy, Mm -hmm. Lamiroy Edition. And and the translator, Gorian Depaltor, and another fellow, Eric Nyarek, combined to work with me free of charge because they so much love Jim Morrison. Of course, he's buried in Paris, and I'm going to be going over there to have a reunion with with these people who have helped me. But I'm also about to do it in Spanish, too. So the other book is Before the Beatles Are Famous. And it's replete with those stories I told you about John Lennon in in the cabin. And at the end of it, that's where I meet Jim's sister, Anna. And then I come to America. So it ends there when I leave for America. And the other one picks up. I've also written this book, Poet Rain. It's a book of verse. And uh, my uh, friend, John Separich, the fellow, he he's a great poet too. And he, he wrote a lovely poem today. And sometime I, if I come back, I'd like you to have him on with me. And he's a great poet, a great storyteller too. And just to let everybody know that your website is coronadoclarion.net. Forward slash silo. That's how they get to your books, right? Yeah, no, that's how it gets to everything about me. With the coronadoclarion.net is just my magazine. Uh I've had that for 15 years. And we tell lots of stories about Jim Morrison, but also the history of my community for 125 years. And a whole bunch of other subjects, including spirituality, psychic phenomenon, and ordinary stories of ordinary people's lives, tragedies, so on and so forth. So that's that's a good read as far as I'm going to got 13 years, 14 years of of, of stories all in one place. And you can look up the top, it says Coronado Culture, and it'll give you all the editions of it. All right. Well, you've got the books. You've got... The magazine, what else do you have going on that you want us to know about? Well, I also have a construction company, and I uh, just finished. I'm also a promoter of hotels. I have a food critic page. I promote good businesses, the ones that I think we do it for free, by the way. We don't charge a nickel. I'll promote the Biltmore Millennium Hotels in Los Angeles. I'll promote Vons, grocery chain, because I've just been on a six-month project with them. I do all, a lot of video about the, how the construction is going and how this old vintage building has been, and what a beautiful structure, and how great Vons' the store is. And in return, the fellows who do the construction, it's 11 Western builders, in, in Escondido, California, they give me all of the stuff that they're not going to use. Cabinets, old, everything that's left over from the project, they give it to me, and I have a warehouse where I keep it, and I do construction projects with it for a low cost for people who, who can't afford a you know, big builder. So we, we go in. And we'll do fixing. Like we're fixing up an old mansion in Coronado right now. Yeah, it's a four-story mansion, bit by bit. And all of the hardware, the wood, the paint, the tiles, lighting, whatever's left over, they donate to me. And I either sell them and or use them in my projects. And I've got several construction projects going on around in my town. And so that's a big part of what I do. I also am a counselor. I also have run my ministry in Pakistan. 
I'm also a musician. I have a group called Frankie Setback and the Ghost Cowboys. We're going to assemble on the 12th again for another. I play up in Los Angeles. And wherever I go, I play my music and I promote my book. And that's essentially my main thrust. But I venture into everything and everyone I meet. For example, there's an attorney in San Diego. His name is King Amonport. He's a wealthy attorney. I think his net worth is $600 million. But he's the very best attorney on earth for accidents. So I brought him a client from that Vaughn's construction site. He broke her arm. She got hit by a car in the parking lot. Not only did he take it on, he took it on personally. And he's got 50 lawyers working with him. He took it on personally. And within two weeks, they were in settlement talk. Now, that is unheard of. Hmm. Unheard of. I'd like to give him a plug if that's okay. Sure. Well, here it is. Watch this. I'm having this. Oh, yeah. He makes these cards. King Amanpour in gold. Got all his information. His phone number is 333-3333-619. But look on the back. He's, it says, God is the greatest. Is God is greater than any problem I may have. So he said, once again, a deeply spiritual man that I met, bonded with, uh, promote his business and have wonderful conversations with him. He has an old church, downtown San Diego, 1865, and he's fixed it up like it's a castle. His beautiful, beautiful paintings and beautiful architecture, I mean, uh, statuary. And it's marvelous to go in there because there's, some of the pews are still left and his clients sit there waiting for him. There's a bit of a, not a, a bit of an altar almost. So very spiritual place to hang out. All the people who work for him are fully aware of the presence of being powerful. And that's what he exudes. All right, Al. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I was tearing up. If you know how to pray, pray every minute you can. If you don't know how to pray, listen to that prayer I pray for you. Or find some place in your world that can give you a short prayer that reminds you that I woke up today, for example, and I said, I didn't die, man. I'm going for it. That's all we have. We have. If we didn't die in the night, we've got another new day that we can try to do, to search. Matthew 7, 7 says this from my Bible. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened. I fully believe these phrases. Look up Matthew in your Bible if you have one. It is the most realistic prayer you can pray. It's ask. All you got to do is ask, ask, ask your God, whoever it is. You're going to seek him out and then knock at the door. And he'll open it, and you'll find comfort in terrible times, in times of grief when you think there's no hope. At least when you think there's no hope, go there and try it. Find a prayer. Call me any time of the day or night. I'm going to give my phone number up. 619-415-2967. If, you, if you're serious and you want to pray, call my prayer line, and I will pray with you. And then you can go out and teach 10 more people to do it. Pay forward. Thank you, Al, for that message. And thank you again for being my guest. I wish you the best and have a great rest of your day over there. Thank you, young man. Thank you so much for having me on. Wait a minute. Do you mind if I give a shout out to somebody else? Sure. Go ahead. 1983, I was broken down. 1986, it happened to me. Broke up with my wife, came to a place called Coronado, and met my future wife. Her name is Kimberly. Father was a doctor in town. We got married, and instantly we bonded. 
and instantly we began to practice the ancient form of Rosicrucian, which is astral projection, out-of-body experiences, and the blue-gold energy that we lay upon you to heal you. That's what the colossalistics in my church do. They put this energy inside them over a sick body. It's Jesus did the same thing. Jesus raised up Lazarus with the same energy. We do that. My wife and I have been doing that. Without my wife, I would be nothing. And the other person in my life is my closest friend for almost 60 years. Her name is Lynn Hobbs. And she and my wife have been my salvation, keeping me on the right track, pointing out bluntly what wrong I would do, but with always with love. And that, I swear to God, if you can find someone in your life like that, open your ears and caress them. Well, I guess it's true that behind every great man is a great woman. It's true. Hey, listen, they, women are a different species than us because they breed the children. They, they watch more than we watch. They watch everything from a benign position of subservience in a lot of years before the, the woman with a kid in the kitchen and barefoot and pregnant. But they have greater wisdom and greater vision than men do. I guarantee you. And they're now coming into the fore. In fact, my wife I want you to listen for this name. George Clooney came to my town about a, a year ago and he was going to make a movie about a school teacher in Coronado who corrupted the entire school system and got a bunch of the kids into a drug cartel called the Coronado Cartel. 60 Minutes did a big story on it. And this teacher, a Spanish teacher named is Luis Villar. He was the Pied Piper and he got all these kids. He got them all selling drugs for him. And one of them was a young 15 year old girl, a doctor's daughter. He ran away with the doctor's daughter, programmed her, gave her cocaine, and she, her life went off the rails. He was arrested. He turned state's evidence against every one of the kids he got involved. They gave him his money back. Mm. And then the prosecutor who prosecuted him came to work for him. Crime pays. Wow. And you know who that little girl was? No. My wife, Kimberly. She's writing a book called My Life Inside the Coronado Cartel. So I want you to keep remembering that. And anyone else listening out there, that's going to be a blockbuster. Well, Al, thanks again. And I wish you the best and success at whatever you're doing. Thank you very much. It, can all, it all helps, you know. Thank you very much. And listen, young man, mm -hmm. I love being on with you because you've got a lovely, lovely center of spirituality about you. It comes out of your eyes, it comes out of your body. And it's, I feel, you know, my other, my priest, Father Murphy, Sacred Heart Catholic Church, you remind me of him because he, even if you're in terrible stress, he'll look at you with the look you're giving me now, which mm -hmm. is, Calm and grace, and you're mm. in a state of grace, young man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.